directed at the Jews of Israel. In April 1948, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sheikh Mohammed Mahawi, issued a fatwa declaring jihad in Palestine obligatory for all Muslims. The Jews, he maintained, intended to, quote, take over all the lands of Islam, unquote. Eight years later, at the height of so-called secular Arab nationalism, a fatwa written July 5th, 1956, by the, by the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sheikh Hassan Ma'amun, and signed by the leading members of the fatwa committee of Al-Azhar, and the major representatives of all members of the fatwa committee, excuse me, of all four Sunni Islamic schools of jurisprudence, elabor elaborated the following key initial point, that all of historical Palestine, having, having been conquered by jihad, was a permanent possession of the global Muslim Ummah, the Muslim community, so-called Fay territory, booty, really, uh, to be governed by Islamic law. Furthermore, quoting directly from the text, we see the conjoined motivations of jihad and conspiratorial Jew hatred. And here are key extracts from this uh, fatwa. Muslims cannot conclude peace with those Jews who have usurped the territory of Palestine and attacked its people and their property in any manner which allows the Jews to continue as a state in that sacred Muslim territory. As Jews have taken a part of Palestine and there established their non-Islamic government and have also evacuated from that part most of its Muslim inhabitants, jihad to restore the country to its people is the duty of all Muslims, not just those who can undertake it. And since, and since all Islamic countries constitute the abode of every Muslim, the jihad is imperative for both the Muslims inhabiting the territory attacked and Muslims everywhere else, because even though some sections have not been attacked directly, the attack nevertheless took place on a part of the Muslim territory, which is a legitimate residence for any Muslim. Everyone knows that from the early days of Islam to the present day, the Jews have been plotting against Islam and Muslims and the Islamic homeland. They do not propose to be content with the attack they made on Palestine and Al-Aqsa Mosque, but they plan for possession of all Islamic territories from the Nile to the Euphrates. On Friday, May 16, 2008, Osama bin Laden's latest reputed audio message proclaimed the jihad, holy war, which he emphasized is a duty to free Palestine, is the most important issue for the Islamic nation. And he urged iron and fire to end Israel's self-defensive blockade of Gaza. Early remarks of, of Hamas MP and cleric Yunus al-Astal, which aired on Palestinian al-Aqsa uh, TV April, two, uh, April 11, 2008, provide complementary and even more revealing context, and here's what he said. Very soon, Allah willing, Rome will be conquered, just like Constantinople was, as was prophesied by our prophet Muhammad. Today, Rome is the capital of the Catholics, or the Crusader capital, which has de declared its hostility to Islam, and has planted the brothers of apes and pigs, i.e. Jews, and this is Quran 560, in Palestine, in order to prevent the reawakening of Islam, this capital of theirs, Rome, will be an advanced post for the Islamic conquests, which will spread through Europe in its entirety, and then will turn to the two Americas, and even Eastern Europe. I believe that our children or our grandchildren will inherit our jihad. These words debunk widely accepted tropes that Hamas is merely a nationalist movement albeit religious, desiring a Palestinian homeland in the territories of Gaza, which it already possesses, Judea and Samaria. Hamas's blatantly annihilationist rhetoric towards Jews in Israel within the 1949 armistice borders indicates that the jihadist organization wishes to replace Israel. Why then, in addition to the monotonous rhetoric of Jew hatred, which is Islamic and specifically Quranic in origin, the unabashed expression of Hamas's will to wage global jihad? Apparently, even the still opposite lessons from America's own first encounter with jihadism have failed to resonate in the current era. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, then serving as American ambassadors to France and Britain respectively, met in 1786 in London with the Tripolitan, that's modern Libya, ambassador to Britain, Sidi Haji Abdul Rahman Aja. These future American presidents were attempting to negotiate a peace treaty which would spare the United States the ravages of jihad piracy, murder, enslavement, and expropriation of valuable commercial assets emanating from the Barbary states, modern Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. During their discussions, they questioned Ambassador Aja as to the source of the unprovoked animus directed at the nascent United States Republic. Jefferson and Adams, 
in their report to the Continental Congress, recorded the Tripolitan ambassador's justification, and here's a quote from the Continental Record, the Continental Congress Record, that it was founded on the laws of their prophet, that it was written in their Koran, that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners, that it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found, and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim, every Muslim, who should be slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. Thus, an aggressive jihad was already being waged against the United States almost 200 years prior to America becoming a dominant international power in the Middle East. Moreover, these jihad depredations targeting America antedated the earliest vestiges of the Zionist movement by a century and the formal creation of Israel by 162 years, exploding the historical canard that American support for the modern Jewish state is a prerequisite for jihadist attacks on the United States. There is just one historically relevant meaning of jihad despite contemporary apologetics. The root of the word jihad appears 40 times in the Quran and in subsequent Islamic understanding to both Muslim luminaries from the greatest jurists and scholars of classical Islam, including Abu Yusuf, Abu Rawiz, Ibn Khaldun, and Al-Ghazali, to ordinary people, meant and means he fought, warred, or waged war against unbelievers and the like. As described by the seminal Arabic lexicographer E.W. Lane, quote, jihad came to be used by the Muslims to signify waging war against unbelievers, unquote. Muhammad himself waged a series of proto-jihad campaigns to subdue, to, to subdue the Jews, Christians, and pagans of Arabia. Numerous modern-day pronouncements by leading Muslim theologians confirmed, for example, Yusuf Karadawi's uh, The Prophet Muhammad as a Jihad Model, confirmed that Muhammad has been the major inspiration for jihadism, past and present. Ibn Khaldun, who died in 1406, jurist, renowned philosopher, historian, and sociologist, summarized these consensus opinions from five centuries of prior Muslim jurisprudence with regard to the uniquely Islamic institution of jihad. Here's what Ibn Khaldun said. In the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam either by persuasion or by force. The other religious groups, according to Ibn Khaldun, did not have a universal mission and the holy war was not a religious duty for them, save only for purposes of defense. Islam is under obligation to gain power over other nations." Unquote. Classical Islamic jurists such as Ibn Khaldun also formulated the concepts Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Haq, Arabic for the House of Islam and the House of War. As described by the great 20th century scholar of Islamic law, Joseph Shack, quote, a non-Muslim who is not protected by a treaty is called a harbi in a state of war, enemy alien. His life and property are com completely unprotected by law. Yusuf al-Qaradawi, spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, head of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, and popular Al Jazeera television personality, reiterated almost this exact formulation of Dar al-Harb during July 2003, both in conceptual terms and with regard to Israel specifically. And these innocent non-combatant harbis can be killed and have always been killed with impunity, simply by virtue of being harbis during endless razias or raids and, and or full-scale jihad campaigns that have occurred, occurred continuously since the time of Muhammad through the present. This is the crux of the specific institutionalized religio-political ideology, i.e. jihad, which makes Islamdom's borders and the further reaches of today's jihadists bloody, to paraphrase Samuel Huntington, across the globe. The essential pattern of the jihad war is captured in the classical Muslim historian Al-Tabari's recording of the recommendation given by Umar bin al-Khattab, the second rightly guided caliph, to the commander of the troops he sent to al-Basra in 636 uh, during the conquest of Iraq. Umar reportedly said, summon the people to God. Those who respond to your call, accept it from them. But those who refuse to pay the poll tax out of humiliation and lowliness, that's Quran 929. If they refuse this, it is the sword without leniency. By the time of al-Tabari's death in 923, Jihad wars had expanded the Muslim empire from Portugal to the Indian subcontinent. Subsequent Muslim conquests continued in Asia, as well as Eastern Europe. Under the banner of Jihad, the Christian kingdoms of Armenia, Byzantium, Bulgaria, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, and Albania, in addition to parts of Poland and Hungary, were also conquered and Islamized by waves of Seljuk, 
or later Ottoman Turks, as well as Tatars. Arab Muslim invaders engaged additionally in continuous jihad raids that ravaged and enslaved sub-Saharan African animist populations, extending to the southern Sudan. When the Ottoman armies were stopped at the gates of Vienna in 1683, over a millennium of jihad had transpired. These tremendous military successes spawned a triumphalist jihad literature. Muslim historians recorded in detail the number of infidels slaughtered or enslaved and deported, the cities, villages, and infidel religious sites which were sacked and pillaged, and the lands, treasure, and movable goods seized. And this classical formulation of jihad is very much a living doctrine today. For example, one can read the openly espoused views and sound Islamic arguments which conclude the contemporary work Islam and Modernism, written by a respected modern Muslim uh, scholar, Justice, Justice Muhammad Taki Usmani. Mr. Usmani, age 64, sat for 20 years as a Sharia judge in Pakistan's Supreme Court. Uh, his father was a, was a Grand Mufti of Pakistan and a major uh, Quranic commentator of the 20th century. Uh, currently, Usmani, is deputy of the Islamic FIQ, or, or Jurisprudence Council, of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, the major international body of Islamic nations in the world. And he serves as, as an advisor to several global Sharia-based Islamic financial institutions. Thus, he is a leading contemporary figure in the world of mainstream Islamic jurisprudence. Mr. Usmani is also a regular visitor to Britain. During a recent visitor there, he was interviewed by the Times of London which published extracts from Usmani's, Usmani's writings on jihad, September 8, uh, 2007. The concluding chapter of Usmani's Islam and Modernism rebuts those who believe that only defensive jihad, i.e. fighting to defend a Muslim land deemed under attack or occupation, is permissible in Islam. He also refutes the suggestion that jihad is unlawful against a non-Muslim state that freely permits the preaching of Islam, which not surprisingly was of some concern to the Times reporter. For Mr. Usmani, quote, the question is whether aggressive battle is by itself commendable or not. If it is, why should the Muslims stop, simply because territorial expansion in these days is regarded as bad? And if it is not commendable but deplorable, why did Islam not stop it in the past? He answers his own question as follows, quote, even in those days, aggressive jihads were waged because it was truly commendable for establishing the grandeur of the religion of Allah. Usmani urges that Muslims should live peacefully in countries such as Britain, where they have the freedom to practice Islam, only until they gain enough power to engage in battle. Usmani explodes the myths that the creed of offensive, expansionist jihad represents a distortion of traditional <laughs> Islamic thinking, or that this living institution is somehow irrelevant to our era. And what was the nature of the system of governance imposed, imposed upon those indigenous non-Muslims conquered by jihad. In his seminal The Laws of Islamic Governance, al-Mawardi, who died in 1058, a renowned jurist of Baghdad, examined the regulations pertaining to the lands and infidel populations subjugated by jihad. This is the origin of the system of dimitut, the native infidel dimit, which derives from both the word for pact and also guilt, the guilty of religious errors. The infidel Dimi population had to recognize Islamic ownership of their land, submit to Islamic law, and accept payment of the Quranic poll tax, the jizya, the tax paid in lieu of being slain, based on Quran 929. Al-Mawardi notes that, quote, the enemy makes a payment in return for peace and reconciliation. Reconciliation and security last as long as the payment is made. If the payment <laughs> ceases, then the jihad resumes. A treaty of reconciliation may be renewable, but, but must not exceed 10 years. This same basic formulation was reiterated during a January 8, 1998 interview by Yusuf al Qaradawi, confirming how jihad continues to regulate the relations between Muslims and non-Muslims to this day. The contract of the jizya, or dimma, encompassed other obligatory and recommended obligations for the conquered non-Muslim dimmi peoples. Collectively, these obligations form the discriminatory system of dimitude imposed upon non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, as well as Zoroastrians, Hindus, and Buddhists, subjugated by jihad. Some of the more salient features of dimitude include the prohibition of arms for the vanquished dimmies and church bells, restrictions concerning the, build and, the building and restoration of churches, synagogues, and temples, inequality between Muslims and non-Muslims with regard to taxes and penal law, the refusal of dimmi te testimony by Muslim courts, 
a requirement that Jews, Christians, and other non-Muslims, including Zoroastrians and Hindus, wear special clothes, and the overall humiliation and abasement of non-Muslims. It is important to note that these regulations and attitudes were institutionalized as permanent features of the sacred Islamic law, or Sharia. The writings of the much lionized Sufi theologian and jurist Al-Ghazali, who died in 1111, highlight how the institution of dimitude was simply a normative and prominent feature of the Sharia. And here's what Ghazali wrote. The dhimmi is obliged not to mention Allah or his apostle. Jews, Christians, and Magians, he's probably referring to Zoroastrians, must pay the jizya, the poll tax. On offering up the jizya, the dhimmi must hang his head while the official takes hold of his beard and hits the dhimmi on the protuberant bone uh, beneath his ear, probably the mandible uh, that hurts. They are not permitted to ostentatiously display their wine or church bells. Their houses may not be higher than the Muslims, no matter how low that is. The dhimmi may not ride an elegant horse or mule. He may ride a donkey, only if the saddle work is of wood. He may not walk on the good part of the road. They, the dhimmis, have to wear an identifying patch on their clothing, even women and even in the public baths. Dhimmis must hold their tongue, unquote. The practical consequences of such a discriminatory system were summarized in A.S. Triton's 1930, The Caliphs and Their Non-Muslim Subjects, a pioneering treatise on the status of the dhimmis. And here's uh, Triton's summary. Caliphs destroyed churches to obtain materials for their buildings, and the mob was always ready to pillage churches and monasteries. Dhimmis always lived on sufferance, exposed to the caprices of the ruler and the passions of the mob. In later times, they were much more liable to suffer from the violence of the crowd, and the popular fanaticism was accompanied by an increasing strictness among the educated. The spiritual isolation of Islam was accomplished. The world was divided into two classes, Muslims and others, and only Islam counted. Indeed, the general feeling was that the leavings of the Muslims were good enough for the dhimmis, unquote. It is within this overall historical context that one must view contemporary Muslim pronouncements regarding the status of non-Muslims under past, present, and future Islamic rule. For example, during a Friday sermon broadcast June 6, 2001 on Palestinian Authority TV from Gaza, Palestinian Authority uh, employee Sheikh Mohammed Ibrahim al-Mahdi reiterated these sentiments with regard to Jews. Here's what he said. We welcome, as we did in the past, any Jew who wants to live in this land as a dhimmi, just as the Jews have lived in our countries as dhimmis and have earned appreciation, and some of them have even reached the positions of counselor or minister here and there. We welcome the Jews to live as dhimmis, but the rule in this land and in all the Muslim countries, countries must be the rule of Allah. Five years ago, in 2003, prior to Hamas's electoral victory in uh, 2006, during a briefing for a visiting United States congressional delegation, then Vatican representative to Israel, Archbishop Pietro Sami, informed U.S. lawmakers that the Palestinian Authority's new approved state constitution, funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, provided no juridical status for any religion other than Islam in the emerging Palestinian Arab entity. The papal nuncio warned, in addition, that the PA had adopted Sharia as the overarching guiding principle of their legal code, thus mandating the absolute supremacy of Muslims over non-Muslims as a matter of law. Archbishop Sambi also initiated a study of the new PA textbooks, which the Vatican deemed to be brazenly anti-Semitic. But how are the jihad and its corollary institution, dimitude, conjoined uh, to Islamic anti-Semitism? Palestinian uh, cleric Wael al zarai during a television program which aired on Al-Aqsa TV on February 28, 2008, intoned the following about the Jews of Israel. And just, you, you, you often, you get these, these sort of hysterical sounding uh, 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 statements, and I'll read you one. Uh, but underneath that is the real theology, and that's what I want you to pay attention. So of course he starts off, uh, by Allah, if each and every Arab spat on them, they would drown in Arab spit. By Allah, if each and every Muslim spat on them, they would drown in saliva. Okay, so we're done with that part. What El al zarads seemingly hallucinatory statement also included this allegation. Quote, from the dome of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, they proclaim that Ezra the scribe is the son of God, unquote. The reference to Ezra is actually a false, intentionally defamatory Quranic accusation. It's Quran 930. Against Jews, citing a claim which Jews, in fact, have never made. But the crux of Al-Zarad's 
remarks explained that the Muslims' blood vengeance, his word, against the Jews, quote, will only subside with their, the Jews, annihilation, Allah willing, because they tried to kill our prophet several times, unquote. These allegations are part of a central anti-Semitic motif in the Quran, which decrees an eternal curse upon the Jews. And this is Quran 261, so Surah or chapter uh, 2, verse 61, reiterated at 3112. The curse upon the Jews for slaying the prophets and transgressing against the will of Allah. It should be noted that Quran 3112 is featured in the preamble to Hamas's foundational covenant. It's literally one of the first things that you would see when you read uh, the covenant. This central motif is coupled to Quranic verses 560 and 578, which describe the Jews' transformation into apes and swine, that's verse 560, or simply apes, verses 265 and 7166, having been, quote, cursed by the tongue of David and Jesus Mary's son, that's verse 578. Muhammad himself repeats this Quranic curse in a canonical hadith. The hadith are the words, deeds, and even unspoken physical <laughs> gestures of Muhammad as recorded by a uh, pious transmitter. So they're sort of crudely equivalent like, to the Gospels. And the related verse, 564, accuses the Jews, as Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas did in the January 2007 <laughs> speech, citing Quran 564, of being, quote, spreaders of war and corruption, a sort of ancient Quranic antecedent of the protocols of the elders of Zion. The centrality of the Jews' permanent abasement and humiliation and being laden with God's anger in the corpus of Muslim exegetic literature on Quran 261-3112 is clear. By nature deceitful and treacherous, the Jews rejected Allah's signs and prophets, including Isa, the Muslim Jesus. Classic Quranic commentators such as Tabari, Zamakshari, Badawi, and Ibn Kathir, when discussing Quran 582, which includes the statement, thou will surely find the most hostile of men to the believers are the Jews, concur on the unique animus of the Jews towards the Muslims, which is repeatedly linked to the curse of Quran 261-3112. For example, in his commentary on 582, Tabari writes, quote, in my opinion, the Christians are not like the Jews who always scheme in order to murder the emissaries and the prophets, and who oppose God in his positive and negative commandments, and who corrupt his scripture, which he revealed in his books, unquote. Tabari's classical interpretations of Quran 582 and 261, as well as his discussion of the related verse 929, mandating the Jews' payment of the jizya, the Quranic poll tax, represent both anti-Semitic and more general anti-Dini views that became and remain intrinsic to Islam to this day. Here is Tabari's discussion of 261 and its relationship to verse 929, which emphasizes the purposely debasing nature of the Quranic poll tax. And so this is, this is an early and very prominent Muslim commentator trying to put these verses together. He says, abasement and poverty were imposed and laid down upon them, as when someone says the imam imposed a poll tax uh, on free non-Muslim subjects, or the man imposed land tax on his slave, meaning thereby that he obliged him to pay, it. or the commander imposed a sortie on his troops, meaning he made it their duty. God commanded his believing servants not to give them, the non-Muslim people, security as long as they continued to disbelieve in him and his messenger, unless they paid the poll tax to them. God said, and here he just repeats Quran 929, um, fight those who believe not in God and the last day and do, not, and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, such men as practice not the religion of truth, uh, being of those who have been given the book, the Bible, until they poll, pay the poll tax being humble. And then he goes on to describe how they should pay the poll tax. The divvies posture during the collection of the jizya should be lowering themselves by walking on their hands reluctantly. Mm -hmm. His words, an abasement and poverty, were imposed upon them. These are the Jews of the children of Israel. Are they the cops of Egypt? What have the cops of Egypt to do with this? No, by God, they are not. But they are the Jews, the children of Israel. By and slain the prophets unrightfully, he means that they used to kill the messengers of God without God's leave, denying their messages and rejecting their prophet. Indeed, the Quran's overall discussion of the Jews is marked by a litany of their sins and punishments, as if part of a divine indictment, conviction, and punishment process. And I'm going to give you the basic motifs uh, without uh, specific uh, Quranic references, but each one of these motifs has a specific reference. The Jews wrong themselves by losing faith and breaking their covenant. 
The Jews are a nation that has passed away. Twice Allah sent his instruments, the Assyrians or Babylonians and Romans, to punish this perverse people. Their dispersal over the earth is proof of Allah's rejection. The Jews are further warned about their arrogant claim that they remain Allah's chosen people and continue disobedience and corruption. Other sins, some repeated, are enumerated. Abuse, even killing of prophets, which has been mentioned before, including Isa, the Muslim Jesus, is a consistent theme. The Jews ridiculed Muhammad as Raina, the evil one, and they are also accused of, lack, of, of being lacking in faith, taking words out of context, disobedience and distortion. Precious few of them are believers. These perverse preachers also claim that Ezra is the Messiah, and they worship rabbis who defraud men of their possessions. Additional sins are described. The Jews are typified as an envious people <coughs> whose hearts are hardened as rocks. They are further accused of confounding the truth, deliberately perverting scripture, and being liars. Ill-informed people of little faith, they pursue vague and wishful fancies. Other sins have contributed to the being stamped with wretchedness, abasement, and humiliation, a central motif, including usury, sorcery, hedonism, and idol worship. More and repeat sills are described still. The Jews' idol worship is again mentioned then linked and followed by charges of other often repeat iniquities, the tremendous calumny against Mary, as well as usury and, and cheating. Most Jews are accused of being evil livers, transgressors, ungodly, who, 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 deceived by their own lies, try to turn Muslims from Islam. Jews are blind and deaf to the truth, and what they have not forgotten, they have perverted. They mislead, confound the truth, twist tongues, and cheat Gentiles without remorse. Muslims are advised not to take the Jews as friends and to beware of the inveterate hatred that Jews bears to bear towards them. That's again 582. The Jews' ultimate sin and, and punishment are made clear. They are the devil's minion. That's Quran 460. Cursed by Allah, their faces will be obliterated, and if they do not accept the true faith of Islam, the Jews who understand their faith become Muslims. That's 3113. They will be made into apes, or apes and swine, and burned in the hellfires. The Quranic curse upon the Jews for primarily rejecting, even slaying Allah's prophets, including Isa, or at least his body double, and that's a whole separate story, uh, is updated with perfect archetypal logic in the canonical Hadith. Following the Muslims' initial conquest of the Jewish farming oasis of Kaibar, one of the vanquished Jewesses reportedly served Muhammad poisoned mutton, or goat, which resulted ultimately in his protracted, agonizing death. And Ibn Sa'd's Sirah account, the Sirah are the early uh, pious Muslim biographies of, of Muhammad. Ibn Sa'd's Sirah account maintains that Muhammad's poisoning resulted from a well-coordinated Jewish conspiracy. It is worth recounting, as depicted in the Muslim sources, the events that antedated Muhammad's reputed poisoning at Kaimur. Muhammad's failures or incomplete successes were consistently recompensed by murderous attacks on the Jews. The Muslim prophet warrior developed a penchant for assassinating individual Jews and destroying Jewish communities by expropriation and expulsion, or massacring their men and enslaving their women and children. Just before subduing the Medinan Jewish tribe by the Quraysa and orchestrating the mass execution of their adult males, Muhammad invoked perhaps the most striking Quranic motif for the Jews' debasement. He addressed these Jews with hateful disparagement as, you brothers of apes. Subsequently, in the case of the Kaibar Jews, Muhammad had the male leadership killed and plundered their riches. The terrorized Kaibar survivors, industrious Jewish farmers, became prototype subjugated dhimmis whose productivity was extracted by the Muslims as a form of permanent booty. And according to the Muslim sources, even this tenuous vassalage was arbitrarily terminated within a decade of Muhammad's death when Caliph Umar expelled the Jews of Kaibar. <coughs> 